Hello, my name is Amul Patel. You're watching the Smoking Hot Coffee Show, where every day, Monday through Friday, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we talk about startups and, and interview startup founders. Today, I'm joined with... Hey, guys. I'm Jeff Pelton down here in San Diego. And we've got uh, Sangeet from Platform.io on today. And uh, this is a really great uh, hour-long interview where he talked about platforms and competition and all the dirty tricks that people have gotten to get their billion dollars. Jeff, uh, tell us more about uh, Sangeet. Gosh, this is a really fun conversation. We talked about all of your favorite topics of uh, hacking your way to the top, mm -hmm. you know, taking your platform and figuring out the best way to seed it with an audience uh, or right. the supply and the demand, the chicken and the egg, uh, get, you know, putting it together and figuring out the best way to, to really uh, attract people to it and uh, get the platform running. And let's not forget the dirty tricks. The dirty tricks, Jeff. Right. So we talk about some of the big guys that uh, use dirty tricks that you may or may not know about. YouTube, Airbnb. Mm -hmm. uh, who else was on that list? Oh, God. Uh, YouTube. YouTube, right? Uh, God, I don't know. Anyways, trust doing. me, guys. Uh, the yeah. billion dollar exits that we hear about. Uh, the early days, you got to do what you can to try to build that audience. And that's what these guys have done. Um, so yeah, it was a really awesome interview with this guy. He studies startups the the way they are different from offline businesses. We talked briefly about that. Jeff. Yep. So he definitely is a student of uh, startups and really studying how they differ from on uh, offline businesses, which is a really great topic I think for all of us to be cognizant of uh, as the online world has made such leaps and bounds and advancements mm -hmm. that we're now trying to take that offline right. uh, more and more and so we're seeing the startup mentality seep into our everyday life in other non-digital forms that yeah. uh, we're used to. So we talk a little bit about like uh, bringing some of these uh, ideas and concepts to the government and government, municipalities yeah. And, yeah. and all sorts of other local Organizations you might be a part of. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're in the transportation, if you're if, you, if you're in law, in hospitals, all kinds of things that were you know that we pay taxes for that, that get benefits. That all the stuff is now being digitized and it's electronic and the, the sending out signals, the sensors, and in the next 20, 30 years, all this, we're going to see some major changes here. And governments either going to slow, be slow to adopt these things, or entrepreneurs, which is what I hope, will go in and 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 create great startups around this and help revolutionize our world. It's the reason why I do this show, to talk about yep. this kind of stuff. Exactly. So. so if you're an entrepreneur, you should uh, have a lot of ideas come out from this conversation. Uh, the opportunities to create marketplaces is still ripe, and everyone's trying to build digital platforms that can help our uh, daily lives, you know, the things that we already do. And we have really great conversation about how the network uh, connects the dots and how that's really the value nowadays. And so I think uh, as a budding entrepreneur or uh, internet startup founder, you should be listening to this and thinking about how you can apply it to uh, your work. Absolutely. And, and Jeff, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah, it's it, all the, it's essentially a network. You know, everything's turning into a network. And everything is turning into this thing that communicates with each other and itself and uh, the surrounding well, elements. And, yeah. You know, as you'll hear in the interview, like he says, Twitter wouldn't have any value if there weren't any people on it. So it's really a dumb tool until the people fill it up with value. Yep, so, yep. Uh, you know, with that, I think we should cut to the interview. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and we talked a little bit about that and also the perils of uh, monopolies and all that kind of thing. So it was, it was a lot of really great uh, stuff. So, yeah, let's uh, cut to the interview. And uh, please tell your friends and family about the show. Um, subscribe to us on YouTube, on iTunes, and Jeff, you want to mention Check us out at smokinghotcoffee.com, and you can e email us info at to get a hold of us and let us know how we're doing. That sounds great. Let's uh, cut to the interview. Hey, Sangeet, thanks for coming on the show, man. How you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me here. Well, it's yeah, a pleasure. All the, way, all the way from Singapore, man. Absolutely, yeah. Well, so what are you doing in the States? So, um... Uh, I mean, right now specifically, I'm here because I work with the MIT Center for Digital Business in terms okay. of uh, understanding how you know internet business models are different from offline business models. So I'm here for some applied research on that, some some uh, talks and lecturing at the MIT Media Labs. That's okay. All right. So really briefly, you were looking at the differences between online e-commerce businesses versus offline and how they market themselves differently. Is that right? Uh, online businesses in general versus offline businesses. So online business okay. models. And how that's different from an offline business model. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, let's get into it. What's what's the big difference? What have you noticed? Sure. So the biggest difference that I see is, uh, you know, in the offline world, in the traditional world, the way we see business is you create something, you push it out down a channel, and then people buy it. And that's right. that's how every product that we have in the offline world, that's how it sells. Now, in the online world, we see 
this happening in the sense that uh, if you go to zappos.com it's about going there and buying shoes right but uh, and zappos is sourcing the shoes and selling it to you but that's not the only model that we see the dominant model that we are seeing these days is a place where the business just provides the underlying infrastructure okay. and users interact on top of it with each other and uh, with uh, uh, other businesses as well so that's what I call a platform. Wait, wait, so, so let me get this straight. So you're saying online, you don't really need to be physically making in the stuff or whatever, just a communications mechanism. Exactly. It's it's a coordination me me mechanism. You you're the you're the coordination infrastructure for that. Right. Well, Jeff, what do you That's think right. of that, man? <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting. So it's you're just connecting the dots, really, the networking piece. Yeah. So so let's take a few examples. If you if you think of in the offline world, you have a store. In the online world, you have something like eBay, which is just connecting the buyers and sellers. In right. the offline world, you have newspapers. In the online world, you have something like Twitter, where you don't need to wait for the news to come. Users can keep broadcasting news here and there. Right. So all, all offline business, business models kind of have an online, online counterpart, which is this kind of a platform model rather than a traditional model. Gotcha. That's, that's, that's what excites me, yeah. Yeah, well, it's exciting me just hearing it. Yeah. <laughs> Very exciting, yeah. and it's still a little hard to wrap your head around. I mean, yeah. the implications are so large, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. How do you wrap your head around this, man? It just sounds like, okay, yeah, I don't need to make anything. I just got to connect people and then throw things at their way, and that, that's is that essentially it? I mean, are you just empowering the creators? Well, okay, so that's a good question, Jeff. Uh, the way I see it is, traditionally, the business itself was the creator. Now what's happening is the business is connecting two kinds of people, the creator and the consumers. Mm -hmm. And these are not two distinct groups of people. We are, we are ourselves playing both these roles all the time. So the right. moment I tweet, I'm a creator. The moment I'm reading my tweet, I'm a consumer. Right. right? Uh, and, 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 the, and the list just, just goes on. Uh, Hold on. You know, I love that one. So wait, you see, you see a blockbuster movie, you're a consumer. But when you leave, you leave a review or you write about it in your blog or whatever. So you're yeah. a creator. Absolutely, and let me let me kind of uh, take that one level deeper as well. So, if if I see uh, let's put it this way, if I if I see a uh, a movie on a video on YouTube, somebody who created the video is the creator, and okay. I'm seeing the video, I'm the consumer. But but the next moment, I can actually engage in a conversation around it where I start commenting on the video, and right. then I'm creating the comments over there. So that's right. There yeah. Kinds of things that are created and consumed. Yeah. Uh, what we need to focus on is what is the main reason you go to a particular marketplace or the platform for? So right, on YouTube, right. go for the video, not for the comments. So oh, this is a, this is great. I love this. It's already starting out on a great note. Yeah. That's right. So it's how you how do you bring all these people to the platform is the the difficult part, right? The chicken and egg. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's that's a tricky one because the whole point about platforms is that they are utterly useless useless bits of code unless users are using it. They right. they are not like SaaS that. I mean, SaaS products have some value, right? But Twitter is essentially uh, a line. I mean, a chunk of code that helps you write 140 characters. Now, how useless is that? Uh, how useful is that going to be for you? Right. So, the the challenge is uh, while building a platform, you need to figure out a what is the first user going to be doing over there. Mm -hmm. If you can find an answer to that, you have an answer to solving this. If you don't have an answer to that, then you need to really, um, you know, find a hook by which. You can get one side on board, so you okay, can. Okay, so hold, so hold on, hold on. So we're talking about here uh, key sort of things to make your marketplace work. Yeah. So yeah. what are the key leverage points? And you're saying the first leverage point is making obviously the product, the first time experience, really great. I'm uh, saying uh, make make the single user experience really uh, worthwhile. So okay. Twitter, for example, has no single user experience. Okay. Yeah, you, it's just by yourself. It's useless. Yeah. It's useless, but Instagram has a single user experience. Even even uh, without a community, you can. Do something with the pictures. With the community, you get added value. Right. So that's you know, th that's where uh, starting an Instagram kind of kind of a model is easier to some extent than starting a Twitter kind of model. Okay. Right. And wow. and there are a bunch of other strategies. If if, if you uh, if you think about it, that we, we when we talked about platforms, we said there's a creator side and then there's a consumer side. Right. So there are various ways of doing it. You you could say that okay, I'm going to target the consumers first. So to get the consumers, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fake the creator side. So think of think of Reddit for example. When Reddit started, yeah, they faked uh, a lot of yeah, a lot they, of profiles. They, yeah, they they yeah. they wrote bots that just uh, kind of 
kept, kept getting in these yeah. names. Made it feel kept... all exciting. Made it feel all, oh, there's something going on here. But it's Absolutely. just the one guy and the robots. Yeah. 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 This is precisely why I had you come on, man. Just this, this right here. This is, this is like one of the hidden secrets a lot of people don't know. But people forget you stuff going. That. When you get stuff going, you got to be a pirate, and pirates behave in pirated ways, and this is the best pirate thing to do, in my opinion. I mean, when you start out, you have to hustle in ways that are not always what you want to talk about later. Uh, if, if you think of PayPal, PayPal did that as well. They yeah, would, PayPal they did it as well, exactly, with their whole they trying to get the eBay. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they'd insist on paying with PayPal. And, well, so uh, tell, tell us about that. To give us a little, little background behind how do, they get the, you know, how do they get people to use their PayPal thing? Early on. So what they did was they went on eBay and they figured that uh, the guys on eBay needed a better payment mechanism. So they went up there and they started buying stuff. They wrote yeah. bots to start buying stuff. And the moment uh, the seller would be notified, he would be told that the payment can be made only through PayPal. Okay, so let me get this straight. So you're saying they had a budget. Let's say it's 500000 Let's say it's 50000 And they bought a bunch of shit. And yeah. they said, all right, we're not going to pay for it unless you use this thing that we're not connected to, but we are connected to. Exactly. And on top of that, they threw, they threw in one more thing. They said that, okay, that's it, but Mr. Seller, if that's not enough, the moment you sign up for PayPal, you get $10 in your account anyway just for signing up. Wow. So, so it's like a bribery. <laughs> it's, it's like, I mean, they, they, had a, yes. they had a crazy burn rate. I love it. I love it. That's great. So they basically bought the market. They bought them to use it, and they almost yeah. bought, they created their own marketplace in a sense. Absolutely. Wow, I love it. What an incredible way to see the, the market for themselves uh, I love in a way it. that people didn't even realize was happening. Uh, I, I wonder if they would feel burned in hindsight uh, knowing you know, that's what was happening. Uh, I mean, it's, that's a great it's, question. That's a great it, question, it, Jeff. It, it's a win for everyone in this case, right? The sellers, a seller doesn't care who's buying it as long as it's getting sold. Yeah, that's true. They're getting paid, yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, for eBay, uh, the eBay populace in general, though, aren't they kind of stuck with PayPal now as, like, the only option, or are, are there alternatives? Well, yeah. so here's the interesting thing. eBay launched a PayPal competitor back in 2002, 2003, and, and then it, it decided that, okay, it was going to make its, its own payment mechanism, uh, you know, it was going to enforce that. And then the eBay community had a backlash on that, saying that, no, ah. we want PayPal. And that led to the PayPal acquisition ultimately. Wow. So do you think that these guys helped stoke that fire as well, like internally, like sent out a bunch of emails and who knows, paid for a lot of people to complain? Is that um, possible? I don't know about that. Don't hey, listen, man. These guys are pirates, and pirates will go to any length to protect their turf. We'll rile up this the is community. Like, this is like, this is ours. I mean, come on, man. This is the kind of shit that I love hearing, man. Fuck all that, like they've made millions and millions. I want to hear the dirty stuff. This, yeah. is, this is the shit that makes me happy. Like, there's so many startups that fail, and it would have been great for them to know, hey, you know, if I could just figure out a way to get a couple of million and buy the market, we'll survive. We'll make it somehow. And well, uh, well, you, know, you know what? It, it's interesting because every, every startup that, that has hit a billion-dollar valuation has yeah. done some kind of... Shady? Pirate, shady like, pirate uh, tactics? Yes. 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 I mean, look at Airbnb. They, they, they pushed a lot of people off Craigslist. Off Craigslist, right? Look at YouTube. In its early days, it went around... Uh, telling hot women go and put, put your pictures online so that the guys are going to come and watch you over there. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's just... Uh, it's awesome. It's, it's I love it. Kind of it's, it's the ultimate hustle, guys. It's the ultimate hustle. That yes, is yes. it. That is the ult This is why I had you come on, man. This is it. This, this is, is great. We love to hear these stories. If you want to tell us more examples, because you know where are people supposed to hear this stuff? Uh, yeah, exactly. Where the hell are going to hear it? Yeah, yeah. we want to. We want. Uh, we don't want to hear all the goods. We want to hear all the dirty shit that went on and <laughs> how these guys got to big billionaires. We want to hear the real yeah. deal. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I mean, a a Airbnb, the classic example. If you've looked at that, so they, they did. They did it two ways. They first okay. of all said that okay, uh, if you're the host and you're setting up a listing on Airbnb, you can posted back onto Craigslist. Then they went okay. to Craigslist and they said, if you're the host on Craigslist, right. why don't you set it up, set it up on Airbnb as well and we'll of get course. you yeah. there. And, yeah, well, and, and did they have like a one-click automated bot do this? Is that how yes. they did it? Or? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the interesting thing, Craigslist does not have an API, so they, they wrote a bot to do this. Yeah, they wrote a bot to do it. I love yeah. it. I love it. Jeff, this is why I had this guy on. Isn't yeah. this awesome? 
No, it's it's incredible stuff that uh, more people should know about yeah. uh, that you know you can do. I mean, it's difficult too. Like as a developer background myself, I've seen a lot of the mashups and sort of Web 2.0 era and uh, Craig shutting down a lot of people for scraping yeah. his page yeah. and, and we talked building about businesses that. on top of it. And uh, I guess you can slip in anyways and just uh, do it the brute force route. Brute force, yeah. 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 And, you know, and I as long as like, enough people don't hit the spam button or, or uh, you know, you know, send flame emails, you know, you're not sending nude photos or something. Uh, no, you need you you're need you're to be helping everyone about. in the end. Yeah, this yeah. is like this is hold on a second, guys. Is this against terms of service? Well, uh, that's you know that. The one about let's talk, let's talk about terms of service. Oh, this is a great this is a great yeah. topic. <laughs> <laughs> so that, you know, that's that's the part that is still open to debate because. Ultimately, what Airbnb was doing with Craigslist was it was taking user-generated content off Craigslist on its own. So the question is, does Craigslist own the user-generated content to start with? Ah, very good. I like that. Yeah. So that's that's where it's stuck in the courts right now. I love that. Wow. So you're saying it's in the courts? These guys actually got sued? Craig went after them? So Airbnb did not get sued. Uh, that happened way back. Uh, Craigslist updated its terms of service, I think, after after this whole fiasco happened. Okay. But a lot of other startups got onto the bandwagon saying that, hey, if, if somebody can do that, let's also do that. Let's fucking do it. Yeah, we got to yeah. survive. We got to make it. God damn it. I want to be a billionaire too. What the hell? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and and it's not just that. There's a whole ecosystem that de developed around it. So there's this company called Three Taps that started just to write APIs for Craigslist. So they said, Craigslist okay. is not writing APIs. We'll write APIs. <laughs> That's brilliant. Like, Jeff, come on, Jeff. Come and tell me. Isn't this brilliant or what? Oh, it's the best. Yeah. I mean, uh, Craig is like the immovable force or. You know, I don't know what their nicknames for him are up in Silicon Valley, but uh, more than a few developers have been frustrated by his uh, yeah, unopenness. Yeah. yeah. And so, and so, what are you going to do? You're you're a technician. You're going to write. You're going to go around the rules. What the hell? Yeah. It's the so web, goddammit. it. You know, you're yeah. going to scrape it. Yeah. And so, that's actually a beautiful example of a platform, by the way, that Craig has that he's kind of locked people out of. You know, because what's the answer to everyone? Like, well, go build your own Craigslist. <laughs> and then, yeah, good luck with like, that. Oh, well, yeah. okay. <laughs> right. So wow, you, man. So, so, all right. So, you know, now that we talked about, uh, you know, all, all this cool stuff that I found on your blog, what, what, what's your story, man? I mean, uh, it looks like you're, you're doing the lecture thing. You, you're going to the schools. You got a startup of your own. What, what are you thinking? So it's uh, okay. So let me please start with a bit of a background. I used sure. to run incubations and. Uh, you know, early stage uh, VC investments for Intuit okay. and uh, worked on quite a few businesses where I moved them from idea all the way to a business. So I, I've got that, uh, you know, I, I, my sweet spot is the, the early stage, moving from an idea, finding the product market fit, taking it till a revenue model. And then after that, th that's the bowling side for me. So okay. it, it's, it's more the initial part that's interesting. So now what I do is uh, I kind of uh, am really obsessed in explaining how running an internet business is running is different from running an offline business and that's what we were talking about some time back gotcha and so you really you really love that whole thing and you just want to talk tell people about it and what about what about me becoming a billionaire man come on let's use some of these dirty tactics and do it you don't feel that urge to make a million zillion dollars well, here's here's the thing. Uh, you won't make a zillion dollars if you go go out looking to make a zillion dollars. You'll make a zillion <laughs> dollars if you if you really enjoy what you're doing and you stick to it. That's true. That's a good point. Good point. <laughs> you uh, gotta have a you gotta have a you gotta have some passion. You hopefully you're gonna yeah. create an awesome product around something that you, a solution or problem. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so aren't there any big problems that you want to tackle? Well, you know, so here's the interesting thing. Uh, what I talk about has really interesting implications because. What we're talking about is how internet businesses are structurally different from offline businesses. Now, today, that is applicable only to startups, but tomorrow it will be applicable to a lot of different things. For That's example, yeah. uh, you know, the whole education industry works in a way where you create something, you, you push it out to uh, students. But in the future, anybody will be able to be a teacher. So right. the, the whole industry can be disrupted. The legal industry That's can be disrupted. That's right. Yeah. The entire entire government can be disrupted. Today, immigration happens uh, on a on a set of rules. So if you, oh, you okay, okay, this, this is getting pretty intense here. Yeah, wow. So, so, All right. So you're talking about public sector, yeah, uh, not just private sector. Any? No, no, absolutely. I, I'm saying that what's happening in Silicon Valley can happen to every part of uh, you know business and public policy in the future. And let me put it this way: think of Facebook. Now, Facebook is actually an economy where people I interact with each other, people interact with advertisers, with brands, right. and with 
uh, app creators now mm-hmm. think of a country a country is also a similar economy with where the citizens interact with each other they interact with businesses who sell things to them they interact with the businesses that create the infrastructure for, for them which are like the app creators on facebook right now the interesting point is that if you can create a news feed the way you have a news feed on facebook if you can create the counterpart of a news feed uh for the country based for the on the country okay yeah. so a news feed for your city your state your local government the, the, was that was that what you mean like a feed so, so a feed of personalized services so if i if uh, if this is my uh, if this is my usage habit if this is how i use my cell phone this is how i use the public transport this is how these are the shops i go to based on that i get a set of recommendations on how i should be living my life and wow so, yeah that's that's fucking deep man right? yeah you're I mean, sure i mean we're tra- we have our phones it tracks us wherever we go we can probably put our purchases up uh, yeah of course a lot, all kinds of things uh, all these so, integrated so, services yeah 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 the, the interesting thing is that uh, you know I, I I live in Singapore and that's where this is already running as an experiment they okay. actually look at all the phone data they look at all the uh, you know the the public transport data where where are people moving at what time of the day and they try to predict behavior based on that okay. and uh, it's essentially what facebook does to us online that can have an offline and that's where i feel that there's a huge uh yeah. need for understanding this kind of business model. This is great. I love this. So you're saying the startups could provide a like a startup to like what is it called B2G where they're serving government and that kind of enterprise instead of B2B is that you're seeing a big growth there is that you think startups can See, oh. uh, what I'm saying is you know in respect of whether the startups do it or whether the government wisens up and does it itself does it themselves yeah yeah, yeah. It, it it is going to happen at some point what what's happening today is the startups are showing the way because yeah. they're the first on onto this yeah uh, but very often you know startups kind of stumble into creating this kind of a business they don't really go out thinking okay they're the producer they're the consumer and they're interacting they don't do that they just say okay i i've got this idea let me find a fit and right. we'll take it from there but yeah. if you think of how the business works if you look at patterns across different startups you see the same thing happening repeatedly and okay. i mean my goal is essentially you identify that pattern and you let the next startup take that pattern and run with it instead of finding it themselves All right wow that's a noble fucking cause man <laughs> so you're biting a lot off you yeah, that's a lot that's a lot hey man, it's it's fun i love it well, well you're writing a book tell us about this book of yours well it's it's uh, got a lot to do with what you already see on the blog which is uh, uh, essentially how do you build internet businesses in a methodical way if you have an idea how do you go via a series of steps on to building a business okay so that's where an understanding of internet business models is very important for example you know knowing that there's a chicken and egg problem to solve and how do you solve the chicken and egg problem is extremely important if you just right. say that i'm going to do this growth hacking business and i'm just going to get a lot of traffic and convert right. the funnels it doesn't matter if you're building twitter all that traffic will convert and will well, end up using a 140 word a 140 character thing that doesn't make sense so okay. So, yeah, those yeah. are the things that I'm kind yeah, of talking about. Yeah, getting both those sides balanced. Yeah, no, absolutely. Jeff and I talk about that all the time, right, Jeff? You're going to have a specific strategy to capture that half of the exactly. marketplace to attract the rest. And uh, you can't just assume that there's going to be a magnetic, like, you know. No, absolutely. So how do you create yeah. that network effect? That, that's, that's really the core question. And then how do you manage that network effect? That is, again, an interesting one. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. So what's a... Uh, I, I, you know, I, you've been doing this for a while. I, I kind of look, you know, did a little research on you. Obviously, you've been, you know, in this startup world for a while. I see you as an advisor for so many startups. What, what, what do you think about that whole advisory role? And, and give us your your point of view on that. Uh, the advisory role in general. In general, and maybe with some specific startups that you happen yeah. to want to point okay. out. Okay, um, you know, I, I think uh, an an advisor that adds the most value when he's not the guy coming up with ideas. because there's there's no end to ideas i mean ideas are just useless okay so a startup needs this direction yeah uh, a startup needs somebody who can say that hey all of those ideas are useless if you have to go after one go after this one or think about you have 10 ideas this is how to think about which one to go after okay that's the kind of guy startups need rather than somebody who says hey did you try that by the way facebook has a blue button today instead of the red one why don't you try that for the change maybe maybe just to work out for you okay all right all right okay uh, interesting so you're okay so let me get this straight so you say instead of tactics you want to maybe the philosophy which which market you're tackling that kind of thing might yeah. get that right yeah and and uh, you know uh, 
I mean, there's no end to looking at tactics and saying we could do this also, we could do that also. It's more about understanding this is what we set out to be. <laughs> what is the one biggest change that we can make today to go in that direction? That's that's okay. where the entrepreneur needs help, and that's where an external uh, eye can really help. Gotcha. So give us a for instance, like yeah. How do you do that? How often do you check in with them? And like you know, like you said, it's more philosophical and less like try different ideas every day. So how often do you? Well, uh, you know, so in, in my specific case, it's 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 uh, there are two specific areas where I help startups a lot. One is uh, in in terms of getting initial traction because that's where a lot of startups have problems. The right. other is in terms of finding a business model for themselves, a revenue model. Right. Now. Right. Um, so l let me take an example. There's one startup which I'm working with, uh, ad advising, which has got pretty good traction, and they are running on a transaction-based marketplace model right now. So yeah. somebody sells something, you you uh, purchase that, you get a, you uh, the, the marketplace gets a cut out of it. Gotcha. What what's the name of the startup? Uh, well, I, I don't want to reveal that. Okay. Right All now. right. That's so, fine. That's fine. <laughs> because the chain that I'm we'll going to we'll just go through your bio and find the transactional one. <laughs> <laughs> no, quite... it's, it's fine, man. Uh, you know, yeah, wh whatever you're comfortable with talking about. It's... Sure, sure. And no, the reason I'm not revealing that is the chain that uh, we, we are working on is still not live. So, uh, okay. yeah. So, so what they're now moving towards is, what if you know we start monetizing on transactions and we just said, hey, if you pay a, f a stand subscription fee, we're going to give you access to the whole supply for a certain period. So. Okay. Interesting. If, like a if rental you, model, basically. Yeah, so it's a whole so different pricing the, model. So, so the question, I mean, so the question that they come back with uh, to me on this is, what are the various scenarios that this will lead up to? Are we thinking through this properly enough? What's the big picture on this? So right. those are the kinds of questions I. Oh, those are up. great questions. Yeah. 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 How can this be gamed? I mean, uh, what, uh, what's the impact on the venue if the worst case happens? Stuff like that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So tell us, uh, you know, you you've been in Singapore for a while. What what uh, how long have you been there, and uh, what's the scene out like that out there? Well, um, you know, I've spent a good amount of time in um, the startup scene in India and in Singapore. Okay. Um, the one in India is definitely a lot more mature. Okay. Uh, but what I'll say is that, like a lot of other startup scenes, uh, a there's uh, both Singapore and India. There's a a lot of people jumping into uh, doing startups because everybody else is doing yeah, it. Yeah, it's a very trendy thing. Yeah, everybody seems to be making a lot of money. Yeah, all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, and 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 in some cases it's like okay, I don't get anything, so I just become an app shop. So okay. <laughs> I need to do, I need to make right, an app. You gotta make money somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so th so that's that's one thing. The other thing is there's uh, you know there's there's a feedback loop. It's just uh, startups want to build what investors are funding and investors right. fund what other investors are funding. <laughs> So, wow, it sounds like a recursive yeah. uh, formula here. It's a bad recursive formula. Yeah, it's a very bad recursive, yeah, because everybody just follows the money, and the money's following the money. Where does it end? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that's, that's uh, you know, the Indian scene had a bad time in 2011, 2012, when okay. the money was going to e-commerce. Everybody else was building e-commerce until everyone realized that e-commerce is not working in India. And so the money <laughs> wow. itself was going. So, okay. anyway. So, uh, wow. All right. So, in your opinion, uh, these guys got to have more original ideas, and honestly, they need to have capital to fund these original ideas. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, go and solve a real pain point, and really do it because you're passionate about it. Know for the fact that you you're going to do that for the next three to four years at least. Nobody right. exists for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what are the kind of sectors or problems you think we should people should be looking at solving? You mentioned like B to government. Uh, what are the you know unique unsolved problems out there? You know, oh, I, question. It's 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 a great question actually. And, I, and I, you mentioned too. Sorry, real quick. You know, the the evolution of sort of like startup idea. You know, the the way we do startups, kind of yeah. applying to other things. Like yeah. you know, so com you know may not even be software at all, right? Sure, sure. So there, are, you know, there are two broad kind of. Uh, Kinds of startups, right? There are startups which help you waste your time, and there are startups which help you solve a problem, okay. right? I like that. So, uh, I mean, Facebook, YouTube, all of these are to a large extent startups that help you waste your time. So we, we kind of get that. We know how that works, and we know we're all competing for the same finite amount of time. Right. Let's talk about the startups that help you solve a problem. Okay. Now, the I mean, the interesting thing over there is. The startups that help you solve a problem usually solve it better than 
the way it's being done right now. Mm. Okay, so this, so there are two there are two aspects to it. First of all, is identifying a problem in itself and mm. figuring out a, a solution that is much better than the way it's working right now. And secondly, secondly, it's about understanding why the current. I mean, what what is in the interest of the current solution provider. So let's take an example. Let's let's think of what Uber is doing to public transportation everywhere. Okay. Now Uber and, and car sharing services are getting a lot of backlash from uh, municipal uh, the, the city councils. Yeah, the city council. The, and it's happened here in Los Angeles. Yeah, they yeah, you know, they just got yeah. shut down, I think. Yeah, it's, they the got shut down. Those drivers, bastards. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. So 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 that's the that's the second part. That's the second phase of solving a tough problem. The first phase is finding a good solution. But the second phase is going head to head with the guy who's providing the current solution right, right. and trying to take the advantage away from him. And right. usually, that that guy's advantage lies in regulation and legal loopholes. Right, regulation, uh, some sort of like union. Yeah, yeah. they dig, they dig I mean, in, trench themselves in somehow. And the technology guy loses, and you're like, what the hell? Yeah, absolutely. So you know what? This is what I call the first mover disadvantage because the first the first startup that goes into it will will have to have the most uh, issues with the regulation. First if, mover disadvantage. This is the first time I've ever heard of that. I always heard first mover advantage. Yeah, everyone talks about that, right? So, <laughs> wow. So the, yeah. The thing is, yeah. You know, I, I, I don't know if I, not to interrupt you, but I heard, I read a story where, um, uh, you know, uh, the guy who invented the Segway is a very yeah. famous inventor. Dean Get Kamen. Yeah, Dean Kamen. Yeah, that's him. Yeah, I, I read that the Segway was, uh, you know, of course it, it they lost all, all their money, whatever billion or whatever was invested in it. They had a huge contract with the postal service to give all the post office workers, you know, to deliver the mail Segways, and the union didn't want that because, of course, there'd be half of them would be fired because it'd be very efficient. Yeah. And so they killed it, and they didn't get the order, and Segway plummeted. And uh, I just now the post office is suffering because nobody sends any mail. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh god, it's awful. I mean, what do you think of that, Jeff? I mean, look at that. Yeah, no, it's kind of a good example of that happening, you know. And I'm sure then there's cheaper knockoff uh, segways that you know they sell, you know, to you know consumers rather than the industrial style approach they were taking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I go to I go to you know downtown Santa Monica, other places where you see some segways because they're very tourist friendly, you know. But I thought to myself, God, they should these should, should be everywhere. But of course, they lost that big, huge, uh, you know, order with post office, and that was it. So, so Sandy, yeah. tell us more examples of the first mover disadvantage. Like what? Yeah, first mover disadvantage. How do you, how do you protect yourself? Well, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, good luck with that one. To anyone who's going ahead with it as well, because. Uh, look at it. A Airbnb is having a problem with landlords. Uber is having a problem with yeah. city councils. Car pooling has had a problem in the past. Uh, to some extent, YouTube had a lot of copyright issues uh, because, mm -hmm. in a way, YouTube was a first mover than you know user-generated video, right? right. So, right. the challenge with a lot of these things is, first of all, what what are you as a platform responsible for? Because there's a lot of stuff that users are doing on, right. uh, you know. On, on, on your thing, what what all are you responsible for? The second thing is, you know, you're creating e efficiency that is undeniably useful, but it's putting somebody else out of business who yeah, or putting them out of a job or yeah, yeah. So 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 usually what happens in these cases is it takes a few years between innovation and regulation to match each other, and if you are the startup which is in that gap. That's the first move disadvantage. Oh yeah, then you're screwed. <laughs> you're badly screwed. Ultimately, regulation has to come around because it, at some point users users sh sh shout about it. Because if you you know this has happened in in Sweden in the past when carpooling.com launched, the entire bus industry went against carpooling.com. But then the users they were saying that we we want carpooling back. Yeah. So this in such cases you know regulation can come in over time, but uh, if you're caught in the middle, you're you're kind of screwed. That's great. I love these technology wars. This is awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's just the one one group of people don't want change. Another big group of people want change. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, the entrepreneur in the middle is trying to make it happen. You know, of course. Um, so. Yeah. I mean, Uber Uber is having a really tough time with that one. Yeah. You know, yeah. What do you think will happen with some of these big guys that you've mentioned? I mean, will most of them survive it, or do you think some of them are in that gap that they're gonna have some trouble, serious trouble? Well, uh, you know, I'm pretty optimistic about Airbnb because yeah, so uh, 
thankfully the, the problem that they're having is more sporadic it's happening only in certain locations uh, uber is, uh, is an interesting one and car sharing services are even more interesting because what happens is uh, so, so car sharing services were stopped in boston just a couple of days back uh, and that was because they started uh, you know running taxis from the airport and that came in the way of yeah. actual taxi services which were paying oh, yeah the big money train yeah that's the big yeah. money train <laughs> so, so, so then, then you're coming in the way of the guys who have the real lobbying part. Oh yeah, they're like, uh oh, no, no, not the airport. This is our bread and butter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Wow. Huh. Uh, wow. Okay. Well, you know, it's crazy part of me, to see what happens. The part of me, Jeff, uh, is a part of the pirate of me. Was like, all right, let's go get that gold, you know. And then, of course, the incumbent business owners don't want that, and it's just this very. Uh, interesting battle. I just think at the end, consumers win, and enough publicity, consumers mm -hmm. know about it, and then they can help. But a lot of times, you know, the, maybe the publicity isn't there, and and then the, and on, the pirate slash entrepreneur gets screwed. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So, would you advise these guys to think more about these problems ahead of time? Like, should they have been prepared and planned, and sort of had a strategy for these sorts of uh, incumbent, or you know, what, you, how do you how do you battle your uh, you know the the existing service providers in general? Sure. Um, the easiest way of battling it is to get acquired by somebody who has the money, so that's what you should ah, do. Ah, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's right. Sell yourself out of the trouble. It's perfect. And, it's like uh, pick, a, pick the fight, get the fight going, and then just sell out to Google. Absolutely. <laughs> Let them handle that. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I love it. You know, that, 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 that's the one that really works every time you do it. Um, with with something like uh, an Airbnb or an Uber, you know, when you start with an idea, you say that I'm just going to rent out my pad to somebody else. It, it all sounds very innocent. But right. over time, you realize that, okay, there, there are these many different people involved, and this is how it's affecting all of these people. It's cutting some, somebody off completely. So right. that's, you know, I would think that right, right from the beginning, you need to have a view of how your platform is... Um, affecting everybody who's participating on it as well as affecting all those people who are losing their uh, yeah. source of income or yeah, source yeah. of uh, value creation because of yeah. people moving to your platform. Mm -hmm. that, that's, a, that's a lens to so keep in mind. You're saying maybe get them involved early on and say, hey, you know, I'm coming. Watch out. <laughs> maybe we can work together. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, I mean you, you do customer de development, right? Do incumbent development as well. Right? Try incumbent to see development. I like that. That's a cool term. <laughs> Incumbent so, development. Thanks. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You know, speaking um, of which, guys, I'm sorry, Jeff. Go. Well, how about, um, I don't know if you have any other good examples like this, but the other day we were mentioning, uh, is it 99designs? And I remember there's a big article and like a whole group against the yeah. website and the service right. that's called NoSpec uh, yeah. for designers that don't want to design, you know, do work on spec that they may not get paid for. Right, which is uh, what 99design stands for, essentially. Yeah, it's their whole model. Yeah, that's uh, their whole model. Great, great for the customers, I suppose, but maybe not so great for the yeah. uh, designers on there. And, designers. you know, I don't know, maybe it'll just shake out with uh, capitalism in the end. But. Well, I have to tell you, Jeff, designers lost. <laughs> they lost because, honestly, the consumers... Well, as a designer, how do you feel about that? Emotion? As a designer, I was, I, was, uh, I was conflicted. Yeah, I was really conflicted, actually. But, uh, ultimately, I realized, uh, you know... Uh, you know, you can, I mean, consumers are you know, consumers. It's their it's their money. It's their choice. And and who are we to limit that? You know, even though I kind of want to limit it, but at the end of the day, they're the they're the they're the kingmakers. You know, they're the ones with the money. So in that case, because there was no way to protect, you know, and, and cut off the SEO or cut off AdWords or no way to market. Nine Nine Designs markets quite freely, and nobody's cutting them off. So of course they're going to gain a, a marketplace there that way. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's still designers on it, right? And there are a lot of budding early designers that don't have any training that would love to do this on the side as their real, as their you know part of income, part of their normal job or whatever, and it works. Yeah, but a lot of designers don't like it; they hate it. Yeah, absolutely. So, Sangeet, do you find that the market usually shakes itself out in some of these cases, or? Well, um, you know, in 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 some cases. Uh, you know the thing is, if you th if you think of something like design, the supply side is so huge that your your problem with creating that marketplace is just getting enough demand on, on board. So, mm -hmm. with nine, something like Nine Nine Designs has gone totally pro demand. You know, I'm I'm just going to make it extremely easy for you guys. So you come on board, and then 
you can always get some supply on the other side. That's right. So, yeah, that's true. I mean, if you think of Threadless, Threadless is working very well on that model, mm -hmm. right? Except that it's not spec driven. It's you come up with your own design, but there's no guarantee that you'll make money out, out of it. Right. Hmm. So as long as you have enough, you know, availability on the supply side that you can play around with, it, it can still work. So, but all right. Still, so that's so that's one of the keys. If you want to create a marketplace, look for a heavy, heavy amount of supply and easy access for them to come on. Yeah. Got gotcha. you. Yeah. Are there any other market sectors that you think are ripe for picking for an entrepreneur? Right now, well, uh, you know, education is something that I, I feel really is changing with Udemy and Skillshare and these guys yeah, in particular. Yeah, yeah um, I completely agree. So you're talking about the secondary, like college and all that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I'm. I, I mean, I, I'm talking more about the unstructured education side of things. Uh, you have a class to share, just share that. So, so those. I think that that a lot more is going to happen in that space in particular because uh, very often what happens with new platforms is initially both the supply side and as well as the demand side you are creating new user behaviors. So learning online as well as teaching online was was uh, was not the norm. Okay. So once right. once you get once one or two companies do this, there's an explosion after that because right. the demand side is already educated enough now to understand this is what I can do online. So then. More than more, you'll see a lot of innovation happening with, with different kinds of uh, twists to it. Now that the demand side is more the way of it, they'll they'll go to the supply side and start giving them something more interesting than what Udemy or Skillshare is giving, for example. Gotcha. So, yeah. So, so, that, so uh, one of, you're an advisor, obviously, uh, to Skillshare. I, I suppose you, there are a good example of what you're talking about here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, Tell us more about Skillshare. Like, how'd you meet these guys? All that kind of thing. Well, um, I mean, we, we, we kind of connected, uh, Michael, the CEO, we kind of connected with the blog. Um, yeah. He loves what I write about, uses a lot of it for his stuff. So he said, why don't we work together on this one? And that, that's how it worked out. I mean, it's, uh, they're, they're doing very well. So it's a great place to see a lot of these theories work out in, in practice. Yeah, so tell us, uh, what, what, what's working for them? I mean, I'm sure you talked to them a little bit. Well, uh, you know, uh, if you think of education, education is as good as the kind of teachers that you're providing. Of course. Right? So, yeah, obviously, uh, yeah. The quality of this of the actual teaching, yeah. Exactly. So whether it's Skillshare, whether it's Udemy, all of these guys just started with going after really good teachers. And okay. that's what worked for them. And what uh, Okay, so let me let me just interrupt you here real quickly. So Skillshare really targeted and found these awesome, awesome educators. That was yes. their first problem that they had to solve internally. Yeah. Yep. Got you, and you're and did you uh, what what uh, how are they how are they going about that? Are they literally uh, going to colleges and asking for referrals from? Not not at all. They they have nothing to do with uh, the colleges and stuff like that. So what, okay. so uh, what, what so so think of Skillshare and Udemy as uh, marketplaces which do not teach you something that you'll be, you'll learn in school. They they teach you skills. So okay. they they'll uh, you know. They'll kind of teach you how to edit video. They'll they'll teach you how to get your first thousand customers, things of that sort. So right. for that, they'll go after practitioners, somebody who's done it themselves, right. uh, and uh, they'll say, "Hey, you know, you know everything about it. Right. Why you've done you it before. You've demonstrated it because you have a blog or something." Or absolutely. So and you're already famous for this. So right. by the way, when you start your course, why don't you bring all of your followers onto that course as well? Oh, uh, once the followers are there, you. Yeah. It, what the marketplace does is it starts serving them other courses, so then the engagement builds up. Oh, perfect! So, Sounds brilliant. And and yeah. in your opinion, uh, do these guys, you know, help the the actual teachers come up with their course themselves, or they, they uh, do they help with the syllabus development or any of that? Or so uh, all of these platforms to some extent do because uh, quality on the supply side is extremely important. So they have uh, a content team that works entirely on this. Essentially okay. helping create good quality content. Gotcha. Oh, looks great. I mean, I love that. It sounds nothing like university. It sounds like practical uh, skills that Absolutely. you can learn and yeah. apply, which is uh, like one of my favorite things. Well, well so yeah. I just want to, you know, go into this a little bit more because this is a very interesting topic to me. Uh, in your opinion, like how many, like how many courses did they need to land to launch, and and how how do you think that they got their first early customers? Like, t tell me more about that. What are your thoughts? Were? So here's the interesting thing about something like a Skillshare or even an Eventbrite, right? Um, you you don't need 
you know, it's not like Twitter that you need a thousand tw people tweeting and a thousand people reading for there to be activity. You can yeah. you can start the marketplace with exactly one teacher who's okay. bringing his students, and okay. you're just allowing the the interaction to happen. Gotcha. And okay. Once that guy brings in his hundred students, you can get a second teacher who brings in his own hundred students. Plus, he gets right. thirty from these hundred, and that's yeah. how you keep building the marketplace. That's a great way yeah. to build a marketplace, by the way. Ah, that sounds great, Jeff. What do you think? Wow. So it's like unit economics there, just one at a time, and you scale it up slowly. Yeah. yeah. Just it's exact. You start with one side, go to the other. And then and, go back to the and, and since one teacher's students may be separate group from another teacher's group, you know, you'll they'll intermingle possibly by each other's courses. Yeah, so t absolutely, the synergy is amazing. I, I, I bet. So. so this is opposed to the critical belief of like, oh, I'll just like get a, a thousand people all at one time and kind of uh, launch it, or, or or what would the the opposite of that be? Like the, the opposite of mistake that people be, make. Yeah, the opposite of that would be I sign up five teachers, I put up the course, and then I go and buy. AdWords on Google. <laughs> right, uh, right. You know, yeah. I mean, that's not really going to work that well. Right, right. right. Okay. Well, the, I, the, I, the opposite of that is that I just put something which has nothing out there online, which is which says teach a course, learn a course, and then right. I start putting users over there. And right. I mean, it's useless when there are no courses over there. Right. Absolutely, and create a whole new marketplace, a whole new thing, entity. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Uh, you know, uh, Jeff and I talk about marketplaces all the time. And the chicken and egg problem. It's always a constant chicken egg. How are we going to get the suppliers? How are we going to get the buyers? What have What have you noticed? We, we had a you know we had a uh, interviewee that used contests to sure. create like quality suppliers. Yeah. Uh, have you What have you found like in terms of crowdsourcing marketplaces and all that? So, so several things, right? I mean, there are, you know there are, uh, you can either start with the suppliers or with the consumer side. So I already talked about the consumer side, which is you kind of fake the supply side, right? So right. the Reddit, PayPal, all of those guys, or the people who are stealing from Craigslist. Now, if you think right. of the supplier side, one one model is that you focus on getting people who already have really good following on, on the supplier side. So if right. you look, look right. at Clarity, Clarity.fm, what right. it does is it it allows anyone to consult somebody else over the phone call but then it says hey why don't you put this up on your blog as well and then people can directly come to you via that. Awesome, awesome. we're going to cut to that screen right now Jeff thank you for bringing it up and there you are your profile right here buddy we, you are charging $3.30 a minute and we are not going to pay you for this minute man <laughs> <laughs> no it's great man have you have you gotten anybody to hire you or what, what's your thoughts yeah I, I've, I've done two calls I think if that's, that's what it probably shows so okay. far and what do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, the model is pretty simple. You have a marketplace over here, but in, but Clarity also gives you a widget which you which you put on your blog. And the moment you put that on your blog, you're you're marketing Clarity yeah, right, of course. to your followers, yeah, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so great. Th that's a great way of solving chicken and egg problems. Just right. use your existing uh, creators and producers to bring in the consumers. Got you. So the trick is is to now if you want to, if you're trying to find high quality creators, you also have to have a filter. Not all high quality, high quality with 400,000 followers or 50,000 yeah. or whatever that happens to be. Yeah. 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 Well, and then really and then go uh, you know, have a sales force or have a private sales thing or whatever and then contact them and get them in the funnel, hopefully convert them and then get the content team to help them build the syllabus out. And that's a lot of work, man. I mean, that's a lot of work. Right, yeah. several months, maybe up to a year to get a good quality supplier base before your customers. Or what, what do you think? What's the timeline looking like? Well, um, you know, it might be a lot of work, but the good thing is this: it is activity happening on day one itself. If you're instead building a, a Twitter or you know something where you really need thousand people on both sides to come and start interacting with each other, you might not have activity over there for ages. It might never take off. This yeah, one actually sure. takes off on day one, and that's yeah. that's what a startup needs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, getting those big, heavy followers uh, on board right away is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, in the internet marketing world, they call it J JV, where you find uh, in other guys that have huge email lists, and then you launch your product with their email list, and then you just go from right. one joint venture to the next because that that list is is the power, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, uh, I was. Are you gonna say something, Jeff? 
Well, yeah, so, so with something like Clarity, the, the two calls that you've had so far, do you think they came in through your website or do you think people came in through uh, Clarity's front door? And no. you know, how do you think they're doing of handling the demand through the keywords? I, I, I can answer that. I, I have not put it on my website. I just wanted to see how the marketplace works for me. Yeah, very good. Okay, cool. Yeah. So but, it worked. But, Obviously, you got a couple of calls, so that something worked. Well, the interesting thing is uh, both those callers told me that they first uh, found me on my website and then they started looking around for me and then they ended up on Clarity as a way of contact contacting wow. me. Wow. Oh, that's awesome. So in a sense, you pre-sold them. In a way, yes. Yeah, that's so great. I love that. Wow. All cool. right, it, it, can, can we say that if you did not have a profile on Clarity, uh, that if you, if this clarity existed several years ago or a year ago, whenever you started your blog, you would have gotten more calls and maybe possibly a little bit more money out of this. Possibly. I mean, I've I've not uh, really gone after uh, this clarity thing as being the main thing. It's it's just something that uh, something that, that, on the side. On the side yeah. yeah, yeah, and I, that's the way I look at it. Jeff, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't this basically piece of money for a lot of these investors and startup founders? Just yeah, I would think so. I think that it's great that they've amassed such a uh, group of experts uh, that are willing to give their time. I'm just wondering how people, uh, entrepreneurs, how people are coming in the front door and finding clarity as a means to speak to these experts, right? Like, how do they know it's out there um, besides that, stumbling upon it or hitting the blogs, like you're saying? I guess no, right now it's all hitting the blogs. It's largely hitting the blogs. Oh wow, okay, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, so it's great. basically a service for all these people. Uh, Amul, another service we covered that was kind of similar to that maybe, that's an interesting marketplace, um, is, uh, was it Style? C uh, Style? Or, Style yeah, C you know, it's like a marketplace Style. for local yeah. hairdressers and stuff. What do you think about yeah. marketplaces well, like that that are kind well, of we had a, we had a really we had a really great discussion. I'm glad you're bringing this up. Uh, just before we, we started interviewing founders and advisors and guys like yourself, we were just, you know, critiquing startups that we would see. And one of the startups that we saw and we critiqued was uh, Style Seat. And one of the criticisms that I made it was that if I, if my stylist tells me to go to the site and, and put a review, aren't I going to see all of her other competitors? And maybe one day, if I don't feel like seeing her, she's sick or something. Am I going to go and eventually find somebody else? Yeah. And and I was wondering about that. Uh, what, what what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. So that's an interesting one because uh, this is. You know, something which is uh, called kind of the negative network effect. If you have too many competitors coming in, the value for each one is reduced. So I, love you this. I, I just love these words, negative network effect. That's the first time I heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> Are you making this stuff up on the fly? This is, awesome. so, uh, this is, this is not something that I've made up. I, I actually talked about this at MIT today. So oh, okay, all right. Anyway, uh, so so there are you know there are interesting ways of solving that. Um, so if if you if if you think of um, uh, you know if you think of B two B marketplaces, uh, a lot of B two B marketplaces came up around ten years back, and all of them failed because what used to happen was when you have too many suppliers on the marketplace, the buyers come and they ask the suppliers to bid against each other, and then right, each other, yeah, yeah. So it it goes down. So yeah. there's this one marketplace that survived really well is a marketplace called Mercatio in Ge Germany. What they did was they they came up with this uh, model where they asked a, a, a supplier to bring in his buyers. If the supplier brought in his buyers, the supplier would have uh, exclusive access to that buyer for the next two years. Wow. However, if another supplier brought in your buyer, that supplier would have exclusive access to your buyer and you would never get access to your, to your buyer over the marketplace. I so, see. Almost like built in a little protection there. I guess built-in protection, and because it said that the first one to bring in gets the protection, they also got the chicken and egg solved quickly. Wow, nice, nice trick to get. Wow, this is an interesting in. idea. Yeah, more quickly I like that. But it doesn't feel like a free market. Then it feels like a protected market. But I guess it is what it is. It's going to survive. Yeah. That's only two, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah I've always wondered uh, the same kind of thing, Amul, that you're posing with, uh, let's say, Open Table or Yelp. If I'm a restaurant. Right. You know, I'm using these cheap services, you know, relatively cheap services, right? They're providing a benefit for me and they're easier, fast or something. Uh, I don't have to set up, spend a lot of time maybe, but now when my customers go to look me up on Yelp or uh, come make a reservation with me on OpenTable, aren't they going to see all the restaurants? Like, all the other competitors, yeah. All yeah, the other Italian like, restaurants. Now they're going to be just one click away from the, the place across the street. Um, I mean, how do the what do you think about how the restaurants look at that? So, 
you know, if if you if you look at uh, Yelp and Open Table, both of them uh, have had a lot of flack to deal with in terms of restaurants because uh, not not just because of what's happening on the supplier side, but because both Yelp and Open Table are kind of monopolies in what they're doing. So oh, yeah. they they kind of dictate the terms, which is oh, yeah. for startup to be, right? Yeah. So um, that's where a lot of uh, restaurant backlash has come in. So that's something that happens very often with platforms because these platforms and marketplaces end up with a winner takes all kind of a dynamic and so you can dictate a lot of terms yeah, but you can tell you can tell all these guys how they operate i mean they're relying on those reviews and yeah, but you can I'm, so, that. I'm so glad we're talking about this so uh, let's talk about when the platform wins and they win the whole thing and they have monopolies and uh, wow uh, you know i have a friend of mine who's a chiropractor and he's had several of his uh, you know of his patients write good reviews and he had a bad review, and unfortunately, for whatever reason, his bad review always stayed at the top, and the good ones were under a filter. And he told me this, and he knows I'm an internet guy, and he's like, why is that? And I'm like, dude, this is a total scam. They want you to pay to remove the filter. <laughs> they probably called like, him once a and month. And they did, and they called him. Yeah, and they called him to try to see if he'd advertise or, you know, whatever. And he told him about the filter, and then the salesperson said, oh, you know, that's an algorithm. We don't have control over that. <laughs> and... Uh, I don't know, man. I think it's. I think it could be a sales tactic. What do you think, Sunky? Do you think it's an algorithm? I, I, I'm. I'm pretty sure it's a. It's a sales and monetization tactic because think of what Facebook does. Earlier, if you posted something, it would go to all your, uh, all the people on your network. Now it asks you to promote it to to go to the same people. That's so right. It's, yeah. I mean, that, that it's pretty much the same thing. I love it, man. I love it. It's the algorithm, but you're you're doing it ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, what do you think of the uh, the endorse uh, button that LinkedIn did to bring everybody back? The little poke me button. You know, I I have a positive and a negative spin on that one. The, the negative spin is that it doesn't mean too much because everybody's endorsing anybody yeah, out there. It doesn't mean shit. Yeah. yeah. But 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 the part of uh, the part that is interesting is that you know so far my LinkedIn profile was just me talking about myself and then. It, you know, it, that, that, that's just me. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. And not What's everybody's going to leave a big paragraph endorsement that they'll be happy to hit a button. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and and the other thing is, you know, what happens with that is you, it's it's actually uh, similar to the way page rank works. The more the number of links to a site, the more important that page is. Right. Now, what you're saying is, the more the number of endorsements for a particular thing, the more likely you are to be good at it. So even page rank can be gamed. Even page rank <laughs> is very often stupid. But right. it's probably the best uh, counterpart of the page that you can get on the social web. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. I'm just saying yeah. uh, I've been on, you know, I've gotten people to endorse me. And no, okay, now I got, all right, great, I got 45 more on entrepreneurship. But that doesn't really mean much versus 43. <laughs> you know, I, well, it's funny when it's someone you worked with like two years ago and you haven't talked yeah, to them. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I don't think LinkedIn uh, really intends to have it mean anything to you. The, the people it will mean something to is really the recruiters. So when they're looking for somebody, oh, with, recruiters. Okay. Yeah. yeah so I thought it was. I thought it was meaningful to their advertisers. I thought they were trying to increase their page views. You know, yeah, they so send out a notification. You're like, oh, great, another another poke. All right, let me go check out the poke. Advertisers, <laughs> advertisers, and uh, recruiters for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was like, this is the best. This is the best page uh, view. Well, uh, slot machine. So let me ask about the evolution of these networks and platforms. Then, like you mentioned, Facebook is now kind of tightening the news on our news feed and like we don't all we don't always get the messages that we thought we were going to receive or that we were sending uh, how do we know that these networks aren't going to pull the rug out from under us or you know tighten the news on us or whatever if you're like a restaurant using Yelp or open table yeah. these things or you know your business is kind of relying on it in a lot of ways mm -hmm. you know what uh, the best example for that is what Twitter did to its entire developer ecosystem uh, uh, yeah. And, yeah exactly there, there is, there is no answer to that. The, the thing is, if if you oh, no, 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 I disagree with you. There is an answer to that. Uh, fuck well, you guys. I we own the network. <laughs> that's the answer. Fuck you. That's, yeah. Uh, come on, let's be honest. They're like fuck these guys. We don't need them. Uh, that's the answer. Yeah. I mean, it sucks, but that's the truth. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, th that's really the answer. Okay. So, so let me let me put it this way. Uh, you, you need to know what you're doing and. You need to know the kind of commitments you are making to, with your users and with your developers, and you need to stick true to that. Otherwise, uh, I mean, very often what happens is the platform starts off with something, making it very sweet so that everybody comes on board, 
the moment yeah. it realizes that everybody's on there, okay, now it's my time to play. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. fuck off. <laughs> yeah. So great example of that Google Plus launched and was very much a clone of uh, Facebook, let's say. Yeah. And it took them forever to have an API, uh, which I was keen of, of as a developer. And uh, social media marketers, of course, are like antsy as hell to cross post everywhere and you know make their yeah. work easier. Uh, I think that's one of those tells as well, like. They're kind of trying to like keep it spam free for the time being until it's like ready, you know, for the you know turn the money on or something. Yeah, yeah. And it's just going to be a whole different experience one day. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so let let me uh, go ahead and move. I was I was just going to say, Jeff, you, you say what can you do, and I'm saying you know the platform owner, it's his, it's he owns it. Tell him to F off. Well, so how about this one? Well, we just talked to uh, Matt Box, who built a company yep. on OpenStreetMaps. OpenStreetMaps. Uh, Sankey, yep. what do you think about open platforms and markets? Um, you know, I'm trying to think of some other parallels, you know, sort of wiki type powered things, like human powered. Maybe, maybe Creative um, Commons, possibly even. Uh, a yes. way to build commercial things off of open source or. Yeah. Um, so, you know, okay, so open source is different from open platform, which is like anybody can participate. So, which, which one are you talking about? Uh, oh, so our example was like um, Google Maps. Uh, they were trying to, they were getting everyone to do these mashups, and then they yeah. kind of they they changed the API or bumped up the yeah. the, the license fees and just started charging. Oh, they charging. sure did bump up those license some, fees. There were some startups actually using it, and their bill tripled or quadrupled, and they're like, oh shit. And so yeah. OpenStreetMaps, I think, has the actual uh, the data, like the tiles and and the locations and the streets, so people can, in a wiki format, can go in and say, oh, this street is now here, the stop sign, or things like that, I think. So, so um, that's, that's, it's that's empowering the part, for other. You know, that's the part which platforms are not managing really well uh, today, because, um, again, there's, whenever you, uh, you're opening things up too much, you're, you're doing it because you want a lot of participation to happen very quickly. And yeah. at that point, you just want to play on the user's terms. And then later on, you suddenly have this huge file under your ass saying that I, I need to, you know, make money out of the users. All the users, vanity, it doesn't matter anymore. And then suddenly yeah. your whole perspective changes. The, the key thing right. is that you cannot change your perspective based on the metric that you are chasing. Your vision cannot change with your metric. Your metric should follow your vision. So you have to define that this is what I want to do and then decide what, uh, you know, how you make a business out of it. Well, you know, I'm really glad we're talking about this. It reminds me of a great uh, post I read just recently where the guy that started Tumblr several years ago really sort of looked down on advertising, hated advertising, didn't like advertising. And then I guess when he just, you know, got bought out with, with Yahoo for, what is it, a billion dollars or something, he was like, oh, yeah, advertising, yeah, it's good. Yeah, we'll have it right yeah. here. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. You know, money talks, guys. Money talks. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Oh, so right. much. We awesome. Time. Well, listen, before you go, um, how do people get a hold of you, man? Well, the best way to do that is go to my blog. There's a contact uh, link on my about page and uh, come to that. That's, that's, that's the best way. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks for coming on, man. It was a pleasure, man. Hopefully, we will uh, chat offline and uh, maybe we'll get together soon. Absolutely. I, I love the discussion. I mean, you ha you guys had some really good questions. Thanks a lot. Okay. Appreciate it. Great. Thank See you. Thanks. Thanks. See you. Bye.